Welcome to the 700 Club. A disgrace, shameful, appalling. These are the reactions to the U.S. vote to abstain on the U.N. resolution, which called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. This action reflects yet another major break between Israel and the United States over the war to defeat Hamas. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. The draft resolution has been adopted. The non-binding resolution passed unanimously with the U.S. abstaining. It was the first U.N. Security Council ceasefire demand to pass since the beginning of the war. The resolution read in part, an immediate ceasefire for the month of Ramadan, respected by all parties, leading to a lasting, sustainable ceasefire. Separately, it also called for an immediate and unconditional release of all the hostages. The resolution did not condemn Hamas or mention the atrocities of October 7th. Despite the abstention, the White House said it reflected no change in its policy. It's very consistent with everything that we've been saying we want to get done here. And we get to decide what our policy is. The prime minister's office seems to be indicating through public statements that we somehow changed here. We haven't. But after the vote, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu canceled the visit by his national security officials to discuss Israel's planned incursion into Rafah. He wrote the U.S. backed down from its stance of linking a ceasefire to the return of the hostages. He added, it gives Hamas hope that international pressure will allow them to get a ceasefire without releasing our hostages. In a statement after the vote, Hamas praised the resolution. Others, like former U.S. Ambassador to Israel David Friedman, wrote on X, just a naked demand for Israel to hand Hamas an ill-deserved victory. Hamas is celebrating the result. That tells you all you need to know. Former President Donald Trump told an Israeli newspaper that Israel has to finish its war on Hamas. We've got to get to peace. You can't have this going on. And I will say Israel has to be very careful. Because you are losing a lot of the world, you are losing a lot of support. Representative Mike Walt sharply criticized the move. It's shameful. We don't go neutral when it, go, when it comes to Israel. It's ridiculous, and if I were Netanyahu, I would, I would pull back his delegation. Democrat Senator John Fetterman wrote, It's appalling the United States allowed passage of a resolution that fails to condemn Hamas. Republican Senator Ted Cruz wrote, Today's resolution is a capitulation to and victory for Hamas. But Senator Bernie Sanders praised the resolution and wrote, the U.S. must push all parties to honor this ceasefire and rush massive humanitarian aid into Gaza to feed starving people. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, already in Washington, warned of consequences if Israel does not defeat Hamas. We have no moral right to stop the war in Gaza until we return all the hostages home. If we do not reach a clear and decisive decision in Gaza, it may bring us closer to war in the north. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, I join with those who are appalled by what the U.S. is doing here. It's giving aid and comfort to Hamas. It's a terror group. What they did on October 7th is absolutely inexcusable. And they have vowed to repeat it again and again and again until Israel is wiped off the map. Israel has to defend itself. Hamas has to end. They, we can't end this and have Hamas still in control of Gaza. That's an end game that the entire world should get behind. Because the next target for Hamas is not Israel, it's us. They're uh, an arm of the, the Muslim Brotherhood. They have, they have vowed to do this to the entire world. Um, they, they had control of Egypt for a brief period of time, but there's a reason the Muslims in Egypt declared them illegal. Uh, there's a reason they've been in jail there, because they incite violence wherever they go. And we're seeing this uh, again and again. When are we going to wake up to the reality of what Hamas is and how they cannot be in power any longer? All the international pressure should be put on Hamas. Release the hostages. Unconditionally surrender. Release Gaza from your cruel grip. Now, when you look at the humanitarian crisis, what's the main cause of that? It's Hamas. It's not Israel. You can say, well, it's the war and all of these things. Who started the war?
Before the war, there was a survey of the people of Gaza. 68% of them said they had food insecurity, which means they were going hungry. This was, there was no IDF anywhere near them. They had complete control of Gaza. They were getting massive international aid, hundreds of millions of dollars, and they couldn't feed their own people. Why? Because they were putting all the money into these tunnels and into rockets and into planning attacks against Israel. We can't trust them now to give humanitarian aid to starving people. It's going to Gaza, but it's not reaching the people. Why? Because of Hamas. So in any ceasefire, do you think that that's going to change if Hamas is still in control? The answer quite clearly is no. Hamas is not the only terror group that uses human shields. Hezbollah is using similar tactics in its, in its, in its attacks on northern Israel. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? Thanks, Gordon. Evidence shows hidden weapons in densely populated areas, hoping Israel would hit those locations. In this CBN News exclusive report, George Thomas shows us how the terrorist group uses Christian farms in southern Lebanon to target Israel. Three kilometers from here, you can see my village there. You can see my olive orchards, my pine trees, and my pecan trees. They get shelled every day since the beginning of war. Joseph, a Christian farmer here, and 12 of his workers recently came very close to losing their lives. I saw death in my eyes. We're concealing his identity because he lives among Hezbollah supporters. The farm sits near the South Lebanon border, close to the Israeli town of Metula. Since the Hamas October 7th attack, his village and adjacent farm have come under constant Israeli shelling. March 13th, they were on the farm when Israel struck. Two minutes after reaching the farm, they hit us with a 120-millimeter mortar. I got hit by a shrapnel on my arm, and when the second mortar was coming, I told the guys to hit the ground and stay flat. It landed 30 meters away from us. Here is why Israel often targets his and other nearby farms. CBN News has obtained exclusive pictures and videos showing how Hezbollah today here in the southern part of Lebanon is using farms owned by Christians in order to launch their missile attacks against Israel. Joseph took these images a few days after that strike showing multiple Hezbollah missile systems in the middle of his olive grove. They keep using our land as a launching pad. They assemble their missiles here, then fire them into Israel. He's been losing money since Robert. daily border fights erupted five months ago. We don't want our land to be a staging ground for war between these two parties. We take no part in this. What's happening in Gaza is not our war. Joseph says he's repeatedly asked the Lebanese army to intervene, hoping to stop Hezbollah fighters from using his farm, but to no avail. South Lebanon is under Hezbollah control, and Joseph says Lebanese authorities have little sway over the terrorist group. We have become accustomed to these strikes happening to us because we live close to the Israeli borders. Sadly, we have no say in peace or war. We Christians always pay the price. Since war began in Gaza, Hezbollah has fired more than 3,000 rockets at Israeli civilian and military targets, forcing the evacuation of more than 150,000 civilians on both sides of the Israel-Lebanon border. The more the war goes on, the more I lose money. Israel and the Lebanese government came to an agreement recently that would allow Christian farmers to work on their properties during certain times of the week. Joseph says he's not taking any chances. After cheating death once, I don't dare to go to my farm again. George Thomas, CBN News, South Lebanon. Fighting a multi-front war. Thank you, George. Well, here at home, search and rescue teams are working to find survivors of a major bridge collapse in Baltimore. A span of the Francis Scott Key Bridge fell into the water after a container ship struck it early this morning. Workers were on the bridge at the time and several vehicles plunged into the harbor. At least two people were rescued and authorities are still searching for at least seven more. Officials say the ship lost propulsion prior to impact. After 
absolutely no indication that there's any terrorism, that, that this was done on purpose. Our criminal intel is working with the FBI and other federal and state agencies to get all the intel that we have, but there's absolutely no indication that it was intentional. For updates from CBN News throughout the day, just go to CBNNews.com. Well, turning to Florida and the state's ban on social media for children, Governor Ron DeSantis signed one of the most restrictive social media laws in the country. As CBN News national security correspondent Caitlin Burke explains, legal challenges are expected. It's not designed to address the content per se, which may receive certain First Amendment protections, but it's designed to address the addictive qualities, the addictive features of social media. A child in their brain development doesn't have the ability to know that they're being sucked in to these addictive technologies. Florida's new law, known as HB3, bans children under 13 from creating a social media account and requires 14 and 15-year-olds to have parental consent. You can have a, a kid in the house, safe seemingly, and then you have predators that can get right in there uh, into your own home. You could be doing everything right, but they know how to get and manipulate uh, these different platforms. Melissa Henson, vice president of programs for Parents and Television Media Council, believes this bill could withstand attempts by big tech to shut it down. It's an important uh, first step and, uh, if nothing else, a warning shot to these media companies that they need to clean up their act. While Florida lawmakers don't call out specific tech companies, they point out regulations would apply to any social media site that tracks user activity, allows children to upload content, or uses addictive features designed to cause compulsive use. States including Arkansas, California, Louisiana, Ohio, and Utah have pushed similar bills, but Ohio and Arkansas were both blocked by federal judges. Let's have different states try different proposals and see which ones are the most effective. And once we figure out which, which solutions are um, getting to the heart of the problem most efficiently, then that can become the model legislation to be adopted in other states. The Florida law also requires age verification for porn sites. Legal challenges are expected as early as this week. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington. All right. Thank you, Caitlin. Gordon, back to you. Well, I applaud this law, and I would say it's high time. As a, as a parent, please be aware of a term that is now part of our language, doom scrolling. And what that means is these sites are so addictive that teenagers, children will spend hours scrolling through videos, and you can name the social media sites that they do it on. Uh, but it's absolutely addictive. And at the end of it, the user having this doom scrolling experience feels drained, feels tired, and certainly nothing productive has happened. Uh, they're getting sucked into an addictive behavior pattern. And the reason the companies want this is they know once the pattern has started, it will continue for their lifetime. As a parent, please exercise discretion. Know what your children are doing online. Know what they're doing on that phone. You can delete apps. You can do that on your own. But it would be wonderful if the state came along beside you and said, we're going to hold these companies responsible. Make sure that age restrictions are established. I don't see anything in the Constitution that prevents a state from protecting children. And that's the bottom line on this one. We need to protect our kids. One year ago, tragedy struck Nashville. A former student opened fire at a Christian school, killing six people, including three students. Well, recently, Charlene Aaron spoke to a group of grieving families who are taking action to keep schools safer. While memories of the Covenant school shooting continue to linger across Nashville, one group of parents is turning their grief into a tangible action plan to keep schools and students safe. Let's go! Body cam video shows Nashville police entering the school, racing toward gunfire to confront and take down the shooter, Audrey Hale. In the end, the shooting left three Covenant students and three staff members dead. Mary Joyce and Melissa Anderson, whose children attend the school, recall the day. The feeling of complete helplessness on that day and trying to do anything to get to my child. They could hear all of the gunshots 
and they, the children, some of them, one grabbed the Bible and, and started praying in their minds as they waited in that moment, hearing what was going on around them, they were preparing to be next. Their kids still feeling the trauma a year later. My nine-year-old, now 10-year-old, she just turned 10 a couple weeks ago, um, doesn't sleep in her own bed yet. She still has nightmares. She is angry during the day over little things. And that's not our, that's not our child. I don't know how to parent that. Anderson says her son, a fourth grader at the time, refuses to open up about what happened. That is heartbreaking in itself because I don't want what he experienced on that second floor to be locked up inside of him. Covenant father of three, Brent Leatherwood. We now know that uh, that evil that day came very, very close uh, to two of our children. And uh, that's, that's hard to live with. A bond these parents all share. That grief really came over me in a wave a few weeks ago when I was sitting down with another mother um, in her home and we were talking about what had happened. Our children were together that day. And, um, and just the emotions that I hadn't seen because I try to hold those back when I'm in public, those emotions came over me. And I was just angry that I have, have to live this life. I'm angry for our community. That anger now the driving force behind a push for gun law changes and safe schools nationwide. Last August, Tennessee Republican Governor Bill Lee called a special session to address the issue. We say, look, we are conservative Christian families who I myself am a gun owner, our families are gun owners, and we own guns, yet we want safer gun laws. Those two can coexist. And we believe what we're asking is in line with the Second Amendment. No meaningful legislation passed in the special session. With nearly 350 U.S. school shootings in 2023, she argues the inaction sends mixed messages to kids. Children, we are going to send you to school to learn and learn about our country. But wait, you might die today. And this classroom that you're learning in and your desk might be blown to shreds and you might be in a war zone, and some of your friends might die, and you may die. Leatherwood, former executive director of the Tennessee Republican Party and Southern Baptist Convention leader, says the shooting has deepened his faith. So I don't want to say I'm in the same shoes as Job, but I think I'm asking some of those same questions that Job was. And I think that's okay, because I think our God is big enough to handle our questions. He also calls for urgent action. This is a, a place where I personally helped as a staff member usher through significant pro-life legislation. I think if we want to be consistent with that pro-life ethic, the same energy and uh, earnest uh, action that we do on behalf of that vulnerable child in the womb, we need to also do for that vulnerable child in the classroom. While Covenant students have been attending classes off campus, plans are to reopen the building. As Easter approaches, many hold on to the hope of the gospel. I ultimately pray for um, healing. I hope that we show witness to other communities that there is healing and there is um, also purpose in the pain. And that uh, beautiful thing can come out of what happened in, in such a horrible, tragic situation. Charlene Aaron, CBN News, Nashville, Tennessee. Well, one of the things I hope happens out of these horrible tragedies, and whether it's this school or Lakewood Church or any of the recent shootings, the um, synagogue in, in, in Pittsburgh, the, there, there needs to be red flag laws. And if you're under um, psychiatric care, uh, there ought to be a flag that you should not never own an assault rifle. Uh, and I think that's an easy one to get through. Uh, can we at least get that one through? That if, if you're in mental care, that you shouldn't be anywhere near a firearm. And, and that should be an absolute rule. 
uh, the, how many times do we have to have these shootings? How many times do we have to have movie theaters in Colorado shot up by somebody who was in active treatment and their psychiatrist was alarmed at what they were hearing in their sessions? Uh, that alarm needs to translate into action, and, and that action needs to be quick, that if they own any firearms, they're they're taken from them. If they have uh, an, an inkling to go to a gun show and buy one, there needs to be a flag that, no, you don't get to purchase one. Uh, that, I think, is a basic. I don't think it interferes with anybody's Second Amendment rights. If you're under mental care treatment, uh, you shouldn't have a firearm. Terry? Gigi was traded for sex and trapped in a nightmare. For years, she looked for a way out of the terrible life she was living. And then one day, while panhandling on the streets, Gigi met someone who gave her much more than just pocket change. These people are supposed to love you and protect you and, and raise you and take care of you. And for someone that's supposed to do that, to be hurting you in a, in a way that steals your childhood, your innocence, is extremely traumatizing. Gigi Calcagno was just a child when her adoptive parents began sexually abusing her and her brother, who was also adopted. It didn't stop there. Physical abuse and, and mental abuse played a big part of, of my childhood as well. I went somewhere else, mentally. Uh, I blanked it out and whatever was happening to my body was not happening to my mind. To everyone else, her parents were upstanding neighbors who provided well for their children and took them to mass regularly. I really thought that, that God was not concerned about me. I thought he was for other people and that this was my life. When Gigi was in her teens, her brother also began sexually abusing her. She was trapped in a nightmare. I didn't see a way out and neighbors, nobody wanted to get involved, nobody wanted to help. Everyone turned a blind eye, so I felt so alone. So I slit my wrist and ended up being taken to a 72-hour hold for an evaluation. After high school, she moved out and lived with friends and on the street. By then, she was addicted to drugs and alcohol. Cocaine, heroin, whatever they had, I took it and didn't ask any questions. Then a friend told her how she could make good money and have access to all the drugs she wanted by stripping. And a friend of mine said she'd introduce me to the owner. I was so naive when I was 21 at that point. I didn't know that she was recruiting me. He was a trafficker. For several years, she was in a relationship with the owner who gifted her with lots of clothes and jewelry, but also later pimped her out. I was in love with the idea of getting out of the life I had. I was in love with someone taking care of me and protecting me and finally providing things for me that I couldn't provide for myself. He eventually got bored with her and kicked her back out on the streets. Gigi then landed in jail for falsifying a prescription and disorderly conduct. She was ordered into what happened to be a faith-based rehab program. I didn't know it was a Christian rehab when I went to register. Gave me a life recovery Bible and I started reading it on my own. I remember we love because he first loved us. That was the first verse that I read and it, it just hit my heart. I was loved by God. Despite this experience, she relapsed soon after leaving rehab. Again, she would fall into the hands of another sex trafficker, a woman she calls Kat, who befriended her. She was a big controller and user, a lot of coercion. She took my ID, my birth certificate, all the money. I had nothing. I was strictly to make money for her benefit. One day, Gigi was panhandling for money in Memphis when someone gave her some money and then invited her to church. He turned out to be a pastor. He paid for my motel room until I could get my paycheck. And that, that Sunday, he arranged a ride for me to come to church and Sunday school. And I was taken to lunch and provided for. It was just amazing, the love. Gigi began attending the church and heard more about the love she'd read about years earlier in rehab. God started speaking to me, and I started journaling, listening to the word all the time. The church members helped rescue Gigi from Cat, and also helped her find a job. In 2017, 
she surrendered her life to Christ. And I just wanted to hear God say, I'm here, I delivered you, I'll keep you safe. And he did. And I started thinking about getting baptized. And my whole church gathered around the swimming pool and I got baptized. I feel like when I came up out of that water, I was officially a new creation. That that was washing away everything that had happened and that Jesus defined me, not my past. Today, Gigi has a church family that loves her, a good job, has a degree, and hopes to write the story of what Jesus has done for her. And Matthew, it says, come to me and I will give you rest. All you who are weary and heavy burden. Well, Gigi's done that. I mean, Gigi walks in the spirit and it's a beautiful flow to see God manifest himself in her life. And uh, it's contagious. No matter what you've been through in this life, Jesus is bigger. No matter what your story has been like with Jesus, your story's not done. Your story becomes his story. God's made promises, you know. He has said, when you come to me, I mean, I'm, I'm here, I'm available. I'm asking you to come to me and I'll take all the burdens, all the pain, all that's been done to you and I'll redeem it. You know what it means to redeem? It means he takes it, he takes back what's been stolen from you, your value. That's one of the things that happened to Gigi. She just felt like she had no value and understandably betrayed again and again and again and misused again and again and again. You know, when someone is in a scenario like that, God is calling to them always and to you as well, whatever your situation might be. His arms are stretched out to you. His spirit is calling you all of the time. But the world's over here very noisy, very noisy. And there are always those people hovering around you who want to use and abuse you. But you can step outside of that. You know, one of the things Gigi said in her story that I thought was so great was she just, as, as she came to know God and to believe that God loved her and that she had value, she just wanted to hear more from him. She got into the word. She didn't have some, uh, you know, highly educated preacher sharing with her the gospel. of She took the word of God and she opened it and she began to read it for herself. We have the privilege and the ability of doing that. In our country, it's very easy to get a Bible and to read the Word of God. If you haven't done that, I just want to encourage you to, re to do that, to find it, to read it, and to understand that those promises made in there are for you because we're His children. God loves us with an everlasting love. He is the parent, if you will, who's never going to betray, who's never going to disappoint, who's always going to be there. The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. You see, people sometimes change. They change because of circumstances that have happened to them, and they change because sometimes they have evil intentions. And sometimes we are the victims of that, but we don't have to stay victims. Because the Bible says when we have Christ, we become victorious, not victims, but victors. If you'd like that today, you can come to Jesus right now. You know, you don't, ha you can't. It's not that you don't have to do anything. You can't do anything to earn salvation. It's been earned for you already. Jesus paid that price on the cross 2,000 years ago. And so it's free for the asking. You've given everything else in your life a chance. Why don't you give him a chance as well? Just come to him right now. Let's pray together. I'll pray with you. Jesus, I am lost. I am doing things I know I shouldn't be doing. Things have been done to me that have embittered me, hardened my heart, made me suspicious of people. I don't know how to receive your love. But I'm coming to you today and I'm saying, Jesus... Yes, I want to belong to you. I want to receive your love to the fullest. I want to know that my sins are washed away, that you've forgotten them as far as the east is from the west, like your word says, that I am a new child before you, and that you, God, will fill me, protect me, touch me, use me, empower me. 
teach me how to follow you. Teach me how to live for you, to walk with you, not just how to get into heaven. That's a promise too, but how to live now, how to receive it all now. In Jesus' name I pray. If you've just prayed that prayer, you've started a great relationship that's going to change your life. I want to send you this. It's free. It's called A New Day. It's filled with wonderful information. What do you do now that you've saved the prayer? We want this to be in your hands as soon as possible. So if you'll call that toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000, we will send it out to you right away. And let me say, when you call that number, if you have a specific need in your life, the person who answers that phone call would love to pray with you today. So call now, and a new life is on its way to you. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News break. Split legal decisions for former President Donald Trump. The judge presiding over the former president's 2016 hush money case announcing the trial will start on April 15th despite attempts to delay. Meanwhile, a New York appeals court handed the former president a big win in his civil fraud case. The court agreed to give Trump 10 more days to post a $175 million bond. That's down from the nearly half a billion judgment he was originally ordered to pay by Monday's deadline. Well, here in the nation's capital, cherry blossom season has finally arrived. Crowds of thousands are flocking to the Tidal Basin in D.C. for iconic pictures. And for some, one final chance to say goodbye to a local fixture. So long, Stumpy. For many, snapping a selfie with Stumpy's shrub-like figure has become an annual tradition. Sadly, though, this year will be Stumpy's last stand. The tree will be cut down along with more than 100 others as part of a multi-year restoration project. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Ranajit is a Christian fisherman living in India, and he wants you to know something. After a tri tropical cyclone destroyed nearly everything he and his family owned, your help restored their lives. A strong tropical cyclone in India tore houses apart, contaminated water, and wrecked fishing boats. Five families share this boat. We have to get it repaired because it is our only source of income. And we are unable to work and meet our basic needs. We don't have any money to buy food for our children or even to fix the boat. We are Christian, so we are praying that God will help us. Operation Blessing rushed to bring much needed relief to Ranajit and Papiya's village. We gave families food and water filters. They gave us milk powder, rice, and more. After the storm, we had no clean drinking water. Now we do, thanks to the water filter you gave us. Operation Blessing also repaired the boat these families share. God answered all of our prayers. I am very happy because I never thought we would restore our boat. We are able to go fishing and earn money again. I am thankful to God for His help. Now I can buy food for my family and take care of all of our needs. The five families who use this boat are equally happy because your help has restored our lives. I'm thankful to everyone who supports Operation Blessing. And I pray God will bless you and give you great joy. That prayer from India is going to you if you're a member of the 700 Club. They're asking God to bless you because you cared enough to give, you cared enough to be there when they needed you the most. If you're not a member of the 700 Club, I invite you to join with us. It's just $20 a month, that's 65 cents a day. Some can join at higher levels. We've got 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. 1,000 Club, $1,000 a year, that's $84 a month. And you'll know that a portion of every gift you give goes into the work of Operation Blessing to help people around the world. Another portion goes into the work of CBN International to preach the gospel around the world. You're part of everything we do when you join. So call us, 1-800-700-7000. Now, when you call, make sure you ask for a Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving. Bank doing all the work. We can send as our gift to you Power for Life, monthly teaching CDs or downloads, your choice. 
So if you'd like that, ask for Pledge Express when you call, or you can go to CBN.com and you give monthly on the internet. You automatically sign up for it. You can also text the letters CBN to 71777. Either way, do it right now. 1 800 700 7000. Terry? Gen Z is the most technologically savvy generation ever. Brian Barcelona is helping bring them to Jesus. His own faith journey didn't involve technology at all. Just some oil on his doorposts and a praying grandma. Brian, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with me. I really just wanted to talk to you about your personal journey of faith. Um, when did you come to the Lord? I was uh, a senior in high school. I accepted Christ September 5th, 2007. Wow. It was a Wednesday night, and uh, I went to church because his family friend said he'd buy me a smoothie if I would go to church. <laughs> nice. I went that night and uh, gave my life to Christ that night. Wow. Never thought, uh, he probably never thought, I never thought I'd be mm -hmm. here today. Oh my goodness. But that night changed my life forever. Yeah. So did you come from like a Christian family? Were your parents Christians, grandparents? So my great-grandfather, Elicio Mendez, planted five churches. My grandma was a believer, and then it kind of skipped over uh, my father. Mm. Uh, my father was is still not yet a believer, but mm -hmm. I believe he will be. Yeah. Um, and uh, I got saved, and so I I I always feel like God honored my great grandfather with not letting that legacy die. You got a, a praying grandmama. I do. Yes. I have a praying grandma. My, uh, you know, my grandma was one of those praying grandmas that would put oil on everything. Wow. Oil on yes. the doorpost, the door handles, couldn't even open up the door handles, so much oil on it. She'd be wake up at three in the morning with a blanket, she'd be with a blanket, you know, wow. praying in a funny language. Yeah. That was my grandma. So she would always uh, speak to me about God. It was actually her words at night that I remembered uh, when I accepted Christ. I just said, God, I don't know if you're real. My grandma talks about you, but if you're real, I dare you to touch me. Mm. And I just felt this, this love hit me in a moment and I just begin to weep uncontrollably mm -hmm. in the back of this room. Yeah. You know, the guy that brought me is like, yes, you know, <laughs> he brings me up to the front and I accept Christ uh, that night and I go home and I just start throwing everything in my room away, just in garbage bags and just instantaneous conviction, instantaneous mm -hmm. gratitude, instantaneous love. And I remember praying uh, in that throughout that week, just saying, God, I'm gonna follow you, but I just don't wanna sit on a pew and, wow. do, and do nothing with my with my with my life. What did it look like to truly follow Jesus after you got saved? There was no ministry ambitions for me. There was no um, there wasn't any goals that I had. I just mm -hmm. would obey God in something small. I, you know, I remember when I got saved, I did a seven day water fast. I didn't know you weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> um, I lost like thirty pounds. And, <laughs> oh my God! You know, I just. I would wow. consume my Bible just nonstop. I'd carry it with me. I'd read it every second I got. I mean, I was possessed with, with a pursuit of God. I was possessed with this longing to see Him. I could write ten books on my mistakes. Mm. You know, I quit a thousand times. You know, yeah. I sometimes grab my Bible, throw it on the floor. I can't do this anymore. And then wow. two seconds later, go pick it up. I'm sorry. You know, yeah. it was this constant mm. um, surrendering. But I think in those years, I learned uh, what covenant was. And I think a lot of times we don't see salvation as covenant, but it is, and, and it leans more on his ability to fulfill his side than our ability to fulfill ours. Wow, yeah. And covenant is never made for the honeymoon, it's made for the hard times. Ooh. And so I Ooh. think for me, yeah. my covenant with God was for every one of those times I wanted to quit. Well, you actually started something called the Jesus Clubs, where you were going into high schools, talking to the students, getting people saved, baptized. Talk about like the genesis of all of that and where it has led to today with you being one of the co-founders of Gen Z for Jesus. We're in 46 countries. We've trained in the last couple of years, thousands of students. I just heard God say, go to a school. I went to the school and it would just, it would grow. I'd heard him say, go to another school. I'd go to that school, it would mm -hmm. grow. So there was never any sort of long-term plan. If you were to look at my life back in that time, there was nothing that was successful about it except my obedience to God as best as I could. And there's tons of things I would have probably done different, but I'm thankful that, you know, I just would do my best just to do what he said and eventually would lead to what we know as a Jesus clubs today. Talk about that a little bit. I feel like the younger generations today, I think social media contributes a lot to it, but they think that following Jesus means 
it has to look a certain way. And if it's not successful, then, oh, God's out of it. I mean, you just said, I mean, from the outside, it didn't look successful, but what mattered was your yes. Yeah, I, you know, I've learned that God doesn't do things in minutes, seconds, hours, days, or even months. He does it in years and decades. Wow. And I think that that is the danger, although I'm a major advocate of social media, the danger of social media today is it's displaying someone's 30 years as though it happened in, in 30 days. Yeah. Um, you know, or you're getting young guys that are getting fame very quickly. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between um, regurgitating information and speaking revelation. Wow. Anyone can regurgitate a sermon they heard or re-preach something. Uh, revelation is that information that's been lived and tested and there's, there's, mm. there's time that's locked into it. And so I, I would encourage young people it's to get their eyes off of what everyone's doing because that may not be what, what God wants for them to do. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, Thanks thank for you. sitting and chatting with me. Yeah. I've known Brian for some time and have watched God use his surrender and his testimony and grow his ability to share the gospel with thousands of people and now all around the world. His latest book is called Don't Scroll Evangelism in the Digital Age, and it's available wherever books are sold. But God bless him and the work he's doing with young people. Amen amazing. and amen. Yes. <laughs> Well, we've got time for some email. Yes, so here we go. This is James who says, Hi, Gordon. I have a question about Easter. In 2024, it's being celebrated on March 31st. Passover, meanwhile, won't be celebrated until later in April. Seeing that the Passover supper is integral to the Easter story, why are we marking these two occasions a month apart? Shouldn't we get the Christian calendar aligned with the Hebrew one? <laughs> Uh, boy, Terry, you start me with a very easy question. <laughs> yeah, take it away. Uh, I actually had uh, my Jewish dentist yesterday ask me the same question. <laughs> that, you know, shouldn't Passover and Easter be the same because the Last Supper is a Passover supper? And I said, you're exactly right. And I agree with you. We should have kept to the Hebrew calendar so that the feasts, uh, the biblical feasts, align up on our calendar at the same time. But that didn't happen. The Hebrew calendar is what's called a lunisolar calendar. It's based on the phases of the moon. Uh, the Roman calendar was based on the sun and how the earth travels around the sun in 365 days. So uh, as a result of uh, the church being headquartered in Rome uh, and Constantinople later, uh, everybody followed the Roman calendar. But I wish it were that simple because... There was a pope called Gregory who was shown by mathematicians that things were off a little bit and so we needed to have leap years and so he created the Gregorian calendar and that was the calendar that Western civilization adopted in the East in Constantinople. They kept with the Julian calendar and so that's why you see the Eastern Orthodox churches celebrate Christmas on January 6th. Uh, and on the West, we celebrate it on December 25th. And Easter is actually different days, depending on which church you go to. Uh, so not only have we diverged from the Hebrew calendar, we've also diverged from each other. So uh, it all depends on how you count days. And, and that's, but I'm, I'm in agreement. It ought, it, we ought to go back to the Hebrew calendar, but I don't have the power to change times. <laughs> And I know the Bible verse about somebody that's going to come and try to change dates and times, and I'm not particularly in favor of that. So we'll just live with it the way it is. <laughs> this is Brett who says, I know you're all big fans of The Chosen. I also know we're taught to never add or take away from the Bible. Don't get me wrong. I love anything that will help lead people to Jesus and to salvation. But it seems like The Chosen adds a lot of storyline that doesn't come directly from the Bible. And I was taught that's really wrong. Can you please let me know what the rules are when it comes to the scriptures and entertainment? I was always told to never add or take away. 
Well, there, there's a specific book, the book of Revelation, that says don't add or take away from this. Um, there's also a passage in Daniel that refers to the same thing. It's specific to those specific prophecies. When you look at um, the gospel as a whole, I'm, I'm amazed that the chosen is getting this kind of negativity that somehow or other it's unscriptural, that Angel Studios is run by Mormons and all this. Uh, what about the robe? What about Ben-Hur? Uh, what about Prince of Egypt? They all added to the storyline and we're not seeing any criticism of them. Here's a word from Psalms. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds.